Good evening, everybody. Um, hello at the reading room here of the Library of Psychoanalysis in the Sigmund Freud Museum. My name is Daniela Finzi. I'm the research director of the museum. And as its uh, representative, it's my pleasure and a great honor to welcome all of you to our tonight's event, to Naomi Seidman's lecture, A Goddess Jew in the Holy Tongue, Rescuing Freud in Hebrew Translation. This lecture is the first part of our conference, Dori Laub, Psychoanalysis and Testimony, Invoking Presence Out of Absence, which will continue tomorrow. So welcome in Vienna, Professor Seidman, and a very warm well welcome to all of the conference particip participants here in Vienna and also via Zoom. Yes, this conference is a cooperation between the Sigmund Freud Museum between the Fortunoff Video Archive for um, Holocaust Testimonies at Yale University Library and the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies. And I'm really very grateful to Stephen Neron here next to me, the director of the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies, for having this idea of organizing a conference on the Laub and the role of psychoanalysis for testimony. Before I hand over the word to Stephen, I may ask you for some minutes because I would like to sum up why this event is especially important for our house here. I would like to sum up the connections between psychoanalysis and witnessing. So, um, Bergaste 19, as you know, is the place, the site where Freud found it. The talking cure, or in other words, the listening with the third ear. This art of listening is also central when, when it comes to testimony. A listener's unapathetic words can destroy the listener as listener and the survivor as a person, as Nanette Auerhahn put it. The museum here was opened in 1971 and renovated nearly 50 years later. And when we started to reorganize the museum and the permanent exhibition, our starting point was the fact that Freud had to flee Austria after the Anschluss in order to survive, in order to die in freedom. Only thanks to his international fame and reputation, he could take all his belongings to London, where, it's still, where his interior is still um, located. So we had to work with the emptiness and the void, which has remained in order to tell not only the life and the legacy of Freud, but also the history of this country that had tried so long, for many decades, to be seen as Hitler's first victim and not as a perpetrator's nation, what it actually was. Four of Freud's sisters, Adolfine Freud, Marie Freud, Pauline Winternitz and Rosa Graf, had stayed in Vienna and were murdered in 1942 in Nazi extermination camps. Today, the permanent exhibition ends with a display case in the gallery, focusing on the murder of the sisters. Also, six apartments of this building, also the two Freud apartments, were used by the Nazis as so-called Sammelwohnungen, as collection apartments. Already in April 1938, Jewish tenants were being told to leave their apartments within a short period of time. A year later, Jewish tenants were no longer protected by the law against arbitrary eviction. However, Jews could only remain in their apartments in case their landlords were also Jews. These Jewish tenants had to take in other Jews as rumors. For the Aryan population, this meant that new living space was created without any new housing being built. At the same time, the Jewish population was forcibly packed together in certain buildings. Ghetto-like situations developed quickly in certain areas of Vienna over the course of the summer 1939. The situation was especially dramatic here in the 9th district, in the area around Berggasse and Parzellangasse. The houses Berggasse 17 and Berggasse 19 were among the most densely inhabited buildings by the Sammelwohnungen. We have, and we do document this in the new staircase, the, the names and the life data of 76 Viennese Jews, mostly elder women, 
who were forced to take water in the spilling. This happened also here in this apartment, the former apartment of Matthias and Stephanie Arbold. Only very few of those who were brought to Bergasse 19 between 1939 and 42 could survive. To make a long story short, today the Sigmund Freud Museum is also a lieu de mémoire, a site of commemoration and memorial to all displaced and murdered Jewish Austrians. Regarding Freud's legacy and our approach to work with the emptiness, with the absence, which is also our annual theme in 2024, we decided to work with books, with books written by Freud, with beautiful editions, first editions, without or with dedication, which belong to our library. After all, Freud's legacy is immaterial, its concepts, its theory, and this needs um, the book to be materialized, sized, in order to be spread. If you know our permanent exhibition, you know that we are also displaying many exciting um, books in other languages, because this is a very elegant and also in incidental way of showing how, how early Freud was read and received all over the world. This started with the first translation from a Freudian text into a foreign language. It was in 1904, the, the interpretation of dream in Russian language. Being confronted with Freud's um, Selbstdarstellung, for instance, in the entrance of the family apartment, with titles of the Selbstdarstellung in French, English, Polish, uh, with titles that differ quite from one another, our guests may already get an idea that the process of translating is never neutral, is never ideologically neutral. And so this is also the topic of tonight's lecture. And I'm very much looking forward to learning more about Freud's German, about the transfer of Freud's German into Hebrew and Yiddish and Freud's ambivalent positions about it. Before I hand over now, I would like to say thank you um, also to um, Eva Maria Kleinschwärzer, who organized the conference. And I would also like to say hello to Mar Marianne Winsberger from the Wiesenthal Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. That was very nice. And for, thank you for reminding us that this is a historical place for a number of different reasons. And for all of those reasons, it's the most um, fitting, fitting venue for this two-day event that we are holding to mark the 45th anniversary of the Fortune of Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies. Dori Lau and uh, Laurel Vlock began recording testimonies of survivors and witnesses of the Holocaust on videotape in 1979 in New Haven, Connecticut. This was a groundbreaking effort to um, document uh, the Holocaust um, through the words and through the, the, the image of the survivor um, with a, a very remarkable and um, new medium, which videotape was in the 1970s, which we need to remember. It's been 45 years, and um, I can't think of a more fitting place to mark and commemorate the work that Dory has done than the Freud Museum. Lau himself, which we'll speak a little bit more about tomorrow, in fact, I hope you all can come to the second day of the event, there'll be a screening uh, of a film about Dory and his work, as well as a panel discussion. Uh, if you haven't picked up a program, please pick one up on your, on your way out after the lecture. Um, but we'll speak more about Dory then. But I just wanted to mention that Dory himself was a psychoanalyst. Um, and his, uh, the influence of uh, psychoanalysis on his methodology for recording uh, testimonies of survivors was really incredibly important. And so I can't, I, I sort of imagine that Dory, who I luckily had the opportunity to meet many times over the course of my work at the Video Archive, would enjoy greatly the fact that we are, we are thinking about him and celebrating his work here in Vienna in Freud's house. Um, so with that, again, I invite you to join us tomorrow for the event. And also, if you enjoy the lecture this evening from Naomi, there will be another lecture on Saturday at um, Young Yiddish Vienna. Uh, Saturday, I believe, at 7.30. But you'll need to check the website, so just Google Young Yiddish Vienna. Uh, Naomi will be speaking again there. So let me introduce uh, Professor Seidman. 
Um, professor Seidman is the Jackman Humanities Professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of, uh, for the Study of Religion in the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies. He's written many books and articles. I won't mention all of them, but I will point out uh, one, of the, one of her most uh, important books, which is the uh, work uh, Sarah Schneer and the Bayez Yaakov Movement, A Revolution in the Name of Tradition, which won a National Jewish Book Award in Women's Studies in 2019. Uh, she's also won, won many awards and, and fellowships, including a 2016 Guggenheim Fellowship, which I believe she used as an opportunity to work on her latest book, which will be coming out in June, titled In the Freud Closet, Psychoanalysis in Jewish Languages, which is uh, published in the Stanford Studies in Jewish History and Culture. Uh, and I'd also mention that she also has uh, a podcast, which I highly recommend you all listen to. Uh, her podcast is, is about her experience leaving the ultra Orthodox community. It's called Heretic in the House, um, and uh, it's, it's well worth listening, so please, please check that out as well. Um, I want to just read a quote from uh, Jonathan Boyer, an eminent scholar, professor, and author, and his words about her latest book, as I said, which comes out in June. Uh, Boyer called Simon's book, and I quote, a continuation of her amazing journey into the presence of our pasts with the reader along for a round trip ride. Language and its charges of identity, repression, rebellion, and gender are her continuing light motif. Here she examines the many readings of Freud in Jewish and many readings of Freud as a Jew, all as clues to the cacophony of known and suppressed desires and revulsions that surround Jewish identification to court. So with that, I'd like to welcome Naomi and um, the lecture she's going to give is A Godless Jew in the Holy Land, Rescuing Freud in Hebrew Translation. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. What a moving introduction. Thank you so much. And thank you also for introducing my work that way. Um, thank you to everyone at the Freud Museum and the Fortunate, Fortunoff Archives. And I'm just, I, I'm so, um, I feel so emotional. This is my first day in Vienna. I've never been here before. And I know, and I'm also not a psychoanalyst. I feel, I don't know why I feel I have to apologize. And I don't, I'm not a scholar of Dory Laub or anything like that. I'm just a translation studies person who fell into basically collecting old Hebrew and Yiddish books that were translated by Freud. And somehow here I am now, which is just, a dream. So thank you so much for coming and for listening to this and for letting me talk about Dory Laub and, and about Freud in a room full of experts. Um, so I'm going to start by talking. How does, I, I should have figured out whether I know how to do this. Oh, here we go. This is the hardest part of my job. Um, among Dory Laub's most moving and personal writings, is a late essay on watching his mother's Holocaust testimony after a lapse of 26 years. Thinking through, yet again, the power and distinctiveness of testimony, Laub writes, in traditional psychoanalysis, the unconscious emerges without much propulsive force through the meandering roots of free association and the, elucida the elucidation of the transference. By contrast, Extreme trauma constitutes, and this is a quote, a power source that drives testimony and exerts a pressure for its deliverance. While testimony might take its place within a spectrum of psychoanalytically informed therapeutic interventions, it nevertheless has some unique elements, including the internal pressure to transmit and tell the real story that is there and the yearning for and presence of a listener who receives it. My mother was like Dory Laub and Chernovitz when the war broke out. Um, she died a few months ago at the age of 101, only a few years after giving her testimony in English to Amud Eish, the Orthodox Holocaust Museum, which is now in the business that uh, Dory Laub uh, inaugurated. She gave her testimony in English, and here, as elsewhere, translation is surely a complicating factor in the propulsive character of this testimony. And I'd like to um, 
dedicate this talk to my mother. As the last of the survivors leave this world, a new kind of urgency is felt in these, in these testimonies, a new temporality of belatedness, mediation, fragmentation, loss, all the affects and displacements that befall translation. By using translation as a metaphor for so many psychic operations, dream work, symptoms, transference, psychoanalysis itself in its hermeneutic mode, Freud also supplied an implicit theory of translation as drive and displacement in the face of repression, censorship, and amnesia. Laub offers the additional nuance of the yearning to tell, the yearning to find someone who will listen. These are existential and messianic hopes, calling to mind Walter Benjamin's view of the messianic role of the translator to grant a work its Fortleben, its afterlife, or perhaps also we might say its survival. Piecing together the broken shards of language, the translator participates in the messianic labor of tikkun, the tenuous and partial repair of a broken world. Something like this mood, this urgent engine of testimony, this messianic translational drive, rises to the surface in the reception and translation of Freud's work in the last decade of his life. In the summer of 1933, Dr. Samuel Perlman, scholar of medieval Hebrew poetry and former dean of Hebrew College in Boston, ran into Chaim Nachman Bialik on a Tel Aviv bus only days before the poet was to leave for Vienna to undergo a medical procedure. Perlman felt compelled to share with Bialik a dream he had long harbored of a translation series devoted to Hebrew renderings of works written by Jews in non-Jewish languages. Recent events had made the project urgent. As Perlman put it, while Jewish writers had enriched the literature of non-Jewish nations, these nations, by which he meant Germany, had thrown their work onto the trash heap or set them on fire. In the meantime, Perlman lamented, the younger generation being educated here in Hebrew are engrossed in the latest trashy novel and they will never understand the richness and anguish of the diaspora Jewish experience. Moreover, the Hebrew writer feels alone. The best among his brothers abandoned him to sing in a foreign tongue, impoverishing our internal culture. If we return to our midst, those spiritual giants who sinned against us, our Hebrew will ring out more richly. In that conversation and for years to come, Perlman cast the Hebrew translation project as a cultural parallel to the physical ingathering of diaspora Jews in Palestine, speaking of the pro proposed translation as a, a return of the straying children, Habanim Hatoim, to their Hebrew borders. Bialik would have missed neither the ideological implications nor the literary illusion which referred to the present wave of immigration while echoing Jeremiah's stirring, stirring prophecy, for there is a keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. There is hope for your future. Your children will return to their own borders. Veshavu banim ligulam, Jeremiah 31. According to Perlman, Bialik was very much taken with the idea of such a translation series and promised to continue the conversation when he returned from abroad, but the reunion was not to be. Bialik died of a sudden heart attack in the city a week after the operation. Mossad Bialik, the cultural institute and press founded in 1935 in honor of the Hebrew national poet, accepted Perlman's proposal. Ooh, I just realized I haven't been using the mic. Do, can people hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so the Mossad Bialik accepted the proposal, um, although it wasn't until 1940 that Perlman could actually launch the series, which bore the meaningful title of Ligvulam, To Their Borders. As a report on the new series explained, 
The delay was due to the difficult conditions of 1930s mandate Palestine, not to a lack of enthusiasm or translators. The series focused on Hebrew, on German Hebrew translation at a moment when the libraries and cafes of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv swarmed with underemployed German-speaking intellectuals in flight from Nazism, although, of course, most of them barely knew any Hebrew at all. Le Goulan, which ran for over two decades with Perlman at the helm, was controversial because some objected to a list that included converts to Christianity and other writers distant from Judaism, Spinoza. But Perlman felt that it was precisely because these writers had strayed that Ligvulam was so critical as a salvage operation of, of Jews who had grown distant from their tradition, but who were now endangered, or their books were in any case. German Hebrew translation in such conceptions was something different and far more affecting than the act of lexical rewording from an original into a foreign tongue. Which tongue was foreign and which a mother tongue? Where was origin and where destination? Where home and where diaspora? All these issues were up for grabs again in the project. Translation itself, so regularly signifying loss, here was conceived as salvage and recovery in gathering and homecoming. As with other aspects of this in gathering, the manifest ideology had latent currents. Zionist, uh, so weird to use the word Zionism, it's such a dirty word now. <laughs> what can I say? Zionist translators wrestled with what it meant to be translating foreign authors rather than obeying the imperative of creating new cultural projects that expressed the pioneering spirit of the time. Translation exposed the ambiguity of the supposedly miraculous revival of the ancient Hebrew tongue. It charted the loneliness of Hebrew writers at the isolated margins of world literature. It awakened a repressed nostalgia for European tongues and the families left behind. And it facilitated an escape from monolingual pressures. If so, then the Hebrew rescue of straying sons may have also rescued the rescuers. Translation was also shaped by the psychoanalytically significant facts that translators were generally, I think inevitably, always, non-native speakers of Hebrew. The cultural context in the background of Emmanuel Velikovsky's 1934 for essay in Imago can a newly acquired language become the language of the unconscious? And what did that plaintive question mean for translating the discoverer of the unconscious? Hebrew salvage translation might appear a marginal and historically specific phenomenon, um, but psychoanalytic translation during those years was swimming in similar effective currents with a similarly urgent and mournful mindset. Ricardo Steiner notes that Ernest Jones, sorry, Ernest Jones initiated the project that would become the standard edition in an emotional letter to Strachey dashed off hours after Freud's funeral, uh, Feb September 28, 1939, five days after his death. Jones wrote, that notwithstanding financial constraints and the winds of war, he was enlisting Strachey in the project of securing a definitive edition for generations to come. Jones, who had turned 60 that year, was clearly feeling his own mortality, warning Strachey that if it is done after our time, it can never be done so well. A few weeks later, after Sir William Baggs, president of the Royal Society, rejected any support on grounds of the war that had just broken out. Jones urged him to reconsider precisely because of Germany's bellicosity, since, this is to quote Jones, to salvage from the mullock of destructiveness something of our cultural and scientific treasures is an aim worthy to rank even with the patriotic duty of winning the war. 
Moreover, those of us who work with Freud are few and old. It is we who must elucidate the meaning of Freud's illusions, which otherwise will be forever lost for those after us. Contra Bruno Bettelheim's famous diagnosis, this standard edition was a passion project propelled by emotions stirred by Freud's recent death, the outbreak of war in Europe, Joan's intimations of mortality, all the complicated emotions between the founder of a movement and his fervent, fractious disciples. The standard edition, too, is a salvage translation, with Freud's followers the exemplary transmitters of an endangered message. Freud's Hebrew and editors and translators have had no similar position, uh, may have had no similar positions at the master's side, but they made it clear that they also felt themselves to be among the elect who shared in the magnitude of Freud's achievement, not through direct investiture by Freud, but through the bond they shared by virtue of being Jews. That others, including the non-Jews in London, were more evidently entitled to express their kinship with the great man only increased the urgency for Freud's Hebrew translators of staking a claim to their own closeness to the man and his plight. London was famous for, as Freud's place of refuge, a center of world psychoanalysis, headquarters for the rescue of Jewish psychoanalysts and the major site for the translation, standardization and dissemination of Freud's writings but Jerusalem too could serve as an alternative far less prominent or even secret sanctuary for psychoanalysis, psychoanalysts, and Freud's embattled ideas with Hebrew translators guiding the way. Um, and I forgot to include a side of this, but Max Eitingan at the Palestine Psychoanalytic Society, I don't know if you know, in his office, he had a map of the world with pins for each psychoanalyst and where they were around the world as if it was the secret headquarters of uh, the psychoanalytic diaspora. The salvage of Freud's work in these tumultuous years was of course aspirational, considering the yawning gap between the metaphorical res rescue through translation and the political and existentialist existential realities it supposedly mirrored, rendering Freud into another language could hardly put a halt to Nazi advances or save the lives of Jewish psychoanalysts. And even salvage translation had to contend with the in inevitable specter of the betrayal and loss of Freud's Ipsissima Verba. In this sense, the rescue fantasy hid powerlessness and shame behind a superhero facade. As it happens, Emmanuel Berman um, I, I don't know how well known he is. Yes, um, I mean he's well known in the translation I mean, circles, but he's well known beyond. Editor of the Amoved um, series on psychoanalysis that undertook to modernize Hebrew psychoanalytic translation in the 1990s, is among those who study the role of rescue fantasies in psychoanalysis. For many who choose psychoanalysis as a profession, Berman believes. These fantasies can be traced to the earliest ties to the mother, to the experiences of loss and restitution, to a reparation of damage caused by aggression, to the need to save a parent, to the rescue of oneself as projected onto the other. These unconscious fantasies do not diminish the value or efficacy of the work. <laughs> Psychoanalysis could hardly exist or the helping professions in general without some kind of rescue fantasy. Psychoanalytic training should not attempt to eradicate these fantasies, but rather teach candidates to sublimate them into a realistic therapeutic frame of res reference, freed from their characteristic grandiosity, narcissism, and regression. Sorry, everybody in this room. <laughs> so evident in the tendency of rescuers to demonize an other. These rescue fantasies, Berman writes, may also take collective form as in the dreams and utopian fantasies that spur national ideologies. Where the training for that will come, Berman doesn't say. From the stylistic perspective, let's see where we are. 
The drive to return Freud to his Jewish brethren found expression in a heightened and elusive Hebrew register. The motive for this, uh, the motivation for this style was no doubt overdetermined. Um, but part of the choice was that Hebrew translators, like their English counterparts, reach for a higher stratum of the language than Freud had generally mined in German. Um, as we know, he combined, let's say, more scientific clinical observations with almost no novelistic storytelling and idiomatic prose. Um, where the standard edition reached for medical or scientific Latin, Hebrew translators reaching higher inevitably bumped up against the biblical and rabbinic Hebrew that they had acquired in yeshiva. If the effect on the standard edition was, as Bettelheim saw it, a flat scientism, the effect for Freud and Hebrew was rather to infuse psychoanalysis with effectively resonant Judaism, striking deep into the network of childhood associations and creating pathways between traditional Jewish culture and Freud's discoveries. The pattern was set by the first three book-length translations of Freud, all of them by Dever, Yehuda Dever Devosis, um, Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego in 1928, the same year, by the way, that Freud was first translated into Yiddish. And I have here a copy of the Yiddish Group, um, analysis, the group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego. Um, from a socialist uh, lending library in Toronto, last, uh, last uh, borrowed in um, 1948. <laughs> um, that was followed by introductory lectures in psychoanalysis in 1934, Totem and Taboo in 1939. Um, and uh, I forgot to mention in, in this slide, but uh, one of these, they were all published by different publishers but one of them was published by a, a, a Tel Aviv press called Yavne, and I don't know how many of you will recognize Yavne. Yavne was one of Freud's go-to ways to describe um, what he called the psychoanalytic diaspora. Um, he spoke to Max Weinrath, the director of the um, uh, psychoanalytic researcher himself and the director of the YIVO Institute in Vilnius, also having to leave Vilna or to rescue um, the, 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 the research into Eastern European Jewry. And he said, we're both like Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai leaving the besieged Jerusalem to start an institute in the diaspora of Yavne. So it's significant that um, Freud was published by a Hebrew publishing house called Yavne. Um, Okay, this, 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 the, um, so this, these three books by Yehuda Dver Devosis, three translations of Freud in 1928, 34, and 39, were followed by um, Svi Voslovsky's 1942 Psychopathology of Everyday Life, decided to focus on totem and taboo and, psychoanalysis and um, the psychopathology of everyday life. Um, both of these, neither of these translators was a psychoanalytically trained, even remotely. Both of them were Bible scholars um, with traditional Jewish educations and PhDs from Central European universities. Um, and Iran Rolnik, who's the great historian of uh, psychoanalysis in Palestine, um, writes that when Wislowski won the Chernikovsky Prize in 1942, for his translation of the psychopathology, um, the committee emphasized that the excellence of his translation of Freud's book lay in its use of the language of the Mishnah and Midrash, creating an illusion that one of our ancients wrote the original. <laughs> Freud himself was apparently not immune from such associations, um, writing in the preface that he provided for Totem and Taboo, and some of you may know that the only two prefaces that appear, that are canonized by being in the standard edition, are the two prefaces that Freud wrote for, Totem and for Yehuda Devere Devos's Totem and Taboo and the introductory lectures in 1934 and 1939, though Freud wrote these. Apparently, it was the only thing he wrote in 1930 at all. I see this is great that people are nodding. This is niche, niche knowledge. <laughs> Um, so Freud, in Freud's uh, introduction to Totem and Taboo, 
He wrote, apparently very moved at the thought that he was being translated into the Hebrew language, that the translation had clothed his words in the ancient language, which had awakened to new life by the will of the Jewish people. It's also true that Freud said very clearly that he considered totem and taboo to espouse no Jewish viewpoint, and that's also a quote. Um, and when he consulted in the 1930s with DeVosis, um, Yehuda, uh, Yehuda DeVosis was in touch with Freud, which was quite complicated because 1930s Palestine, not too many people had phones, and Freud's Hebrew translators were not among those who had phones. So being in touch with Freud required a letter in which you made an appointment at which De Devere DeVosis would go to a nearby cafe in the Jerusalem neighborhood where he lived, where they did have a phone, to consult with Freud. So Freud was involved in this translation to some extent, and Freud really tried to talk DeVosis out of working on totem and taboo, sorry, totem, totem and taboo, um, because he said, I'm working on a much more Jewish book that I think you'll <laughs> like better, um, called Moses and Monotheism. Um, DeVosis, for his part, let Freud know when the book was already in press and it was too late for Freud to do anything about it, that he had added some footnotes intending to corroborate the claims of your book and occasionally shed new light on them. The new light, although DeVosis didn't say it, actually occasionally involved direct contradiction, um, as when DeVosis took issue with Freud's suggestion that the term taboo might be translated as kadesh in Hebrew translation, in, in Hebrew, which is, in other words, Freud is doing Hebrew translation in totem and taboo, and his Hebrew translator, who obviously this is his turf, um, suggests that a better translation would be cherem, or the Arabic aram, um, as a closer fit. Devosis is, wow, that's a hard word to put a, uh, possessive on. Devosis's copious translator's footnotes to Totem and Taboo only rarely do the usual work of clarifying ambiguities. They function rather as a tissue of citations from Jewish sources that bear an indirect relation to Freud's text, leaving it to his readers to figure out what the connection is between what he's saying and what Freud is saying. One such footnote is appended to Freud's description of the horror and of incest that governs the relationship between a mother-in-law and a son-in-law, adding to Freud's citation, so there are four footnotes there, the two short ones are Freud, and the two long ones are Devosis. So Freud cites Fra uh, Frazier's Totemism and Exogamy, and Devosis asserts, I'm, I'm gonna read some, small, translate some small part of it, this point has a few substantiating sources in the sages. He cites four Talmudic passages that warn against too much conversation between a mother-in-law and a son-in-law. Two paragraphs later, Freud mentions marriage by cap capture, and this elicits a shorter reference to Judges 2119, where the men of the tribes of Benjamin um, kept from finding wives, I forget why, sees a wife from among the girls of Shiloh. Shiloh. To the discussion, uh, this is, I think, also an interesting one. To the, oh, I think the, you're not actually looking at this, this, this. I'm about to talk about this page. So I know that Ohad must be it reading is, this. I'm very confused, right? It is the one. Oh, it is the one. Yes, it's uh, oh. about the kidnapping. The oh, the kidnapping. Yeah, okay, no. I forget. I'm doing this with my phone at the last minute, of course. <laughs> to the discussion of the totem animals that clans and individuals adopt, Devosis append a string of biblical citations that, so, so Freud says that um, clans and individuals adopt uh, totem, totemic names. Um, Devosis appends, a I'll just remind you, Freud said this is not about Jews. Devosis begs to differ. There are a string of biblical citations that describe the tribes as various animals. Judah is a lion's whelp. Yisachar is a strong-boned ass. Dan shall be a serpent by the road. Naphtali, Benjamin, they're all animals. Turns out um, 
the Bible is full of totemic names. To this, Devosis adds other Hebrew names that also mean animals, including Hulda, rat, not such a nice name, Arye, lion, Zev, wolf. These notes imply that the Bible, contra Freud, should be counted among the totemic cultures. But given that the practice of naming Jewish children after animals continues to the present day, and indeed increased in the Zionist culture that prized Hebrew names over those derived from other languages, it's clear that Jewish totemism is not a dead religion. If these are over translations or translation errors, psychoanalysis teaches us that there is no meaningless slip, that a failure may also be a, an achievement, right? Fehleistung. That Devosis was onto something. And in fact, Jewish totemists were among the neurotics who sought psychoanalytic treatment in the Holy Land. The only clinical study that's included in the 1950 memorial volume for Max Eitingan, which was published by the um, Israel Psychoanalytic Society, um, presents the case of a young man whose horror of incest extends beyond his mother, whose name was Chaya, life or animal, um, wild animal, to any woman who bore an animal name, Tzipora, Devora, Rachel, Yael, lots of women. Unfortunately for the young man, these were and are common Jewish names, even if over the centuries, the animal meanings had become dead metaphors. By creating a Hebrew speaking culture that brought these names to life, the Hebrew revival also succeeded in reviving their repressed totemism, awakening animals asleep for centuries within traditional Jewish naming practices. How am I doing? This is okay, yeah. The same practice of awakening religious meanings buried in the historical strata of Hebrew marks the translation of the psychopathology of everyday life. Um, um, it's actually the second book to be published in Perlman's Ligvulam series, To Their Borders. And, um, and it's the place where Freud reckons with the meaningfulness of slips and other mistakes. And so very important for translation theory. This effect is most evident, I think, in the section devoted to the unconscious forces that render household objects so liable to breakage. Freud traces such accidents to all kinds of desires, a desire to fix a friendship gone wrong, um, unhappy relations between employer and, employ and employee, and the sexual tensions and family rivalries that trouble even the most serene of bourgeois Viennese households, including Freud's own, which as we know was rather overstuffed with fragile objects. Translation also reveals the unconscious forces that lead to a mishandled transmission, an eruption of the otherwise unsaid, a failure to grasp something correctly. Thus, when Freud knocks over a handsome glazed Egyptian fig figurine as unconscious penance for psychoanalyzing a friend who never asked him to be psychoanalyzed, um, Voslavsky allows us to hear Freud's penance as following a traditional Jewish path. Freud does tshuva, um, and he recognizes the breakage as biblical iconoclasm and propitiatory sacrifice. So Freud breaks a pestle, an idol, which people are always making that kind of joke that his, he was, had idols in his house. In the Hebrew, that's what he has. Um, and what he does to propitiate or to atone for this sin is called a korban mincha, which for the biblical scholars in this room, there must be some, right? Uh, basically, uh, the book of Leviticus says a lot about this kind of propitiatory sacrifice. Um, so too does the minor epidemic of broken glass and ceramic weirs. Um, that overtakes the Freud household during the engagement of his older, oldest daughter, 
Um, in Hebrew, this sad season of breakage echoes the divine accident and cosmic catastrophe of what we know in Lurianic Kabbalah as Shvirata Kelim. Um, Shvirata Kelim, the breaking of the vessels, which is the first thing that happens in the cosmos with the Lurianic idea of creation. Um, this breaking of the vessels, which Luria believes it's our job to fix, appears many centuries later as the mystical background to the task of the translator, who is supposed to repair, and here I'm quoting Benjamin's task of the translator, fragments of a vessel which are to be glued together. Freud bring, brings antiquities into his home for the secular purpose of anthropological display. His Hebrew translators also mine the runes of ancient Hebrew in search of words that might bring home Freud's supremely modern thought. But in Freud's household and in its Hebrew translation, the unmooring of these words and objects from ancient religious contexts unleashes ancient powers. Gershom Sholem considers with such effects inevitable, writing that the Zionist attempt to transform Hebrew, the language that carries God's words into a spoken and useful language is a false profane articulation of holy names in the danger of their return from the silent forgotten layers of the language lies the umheimlichkeit of the new hebrew if hebrew is a repository of irrational and uncanny energies translating freud's work about unreason and ancient religions raises ghosts buried in both freud's german and his translator's hebrew it's not always possible to say whether Freud's Hebrew translators discovered Jewish themes in Freud, or rather imposed them consciously or through the language itself, or through their own unconsciousness. Um, the passage in the psychopathology that describes the epidemic that preceded Matilda's marriage implies that Freud is, Freud's breaking plates had a sexual ideology, and that's much clearer in the larger context. But Freud makes it clear that, the, the, that wedding traditions were also involved, writing, at these celebrations, it's generally customary to break some dishes and bless the shards. And that's the Brill translation, not the Tyson's uh, standard edition that I just quoted. And Freud, in fact, during this period, we know, Freud may have felt himself stymied from being the one to break the symbolic glass, a role reserved for Robert Hollitscher, his new son-in-law, a nice enough banker that Matilda had met on, on holiday. Or perhaps he hoped to be the one to break the plate, which is as parents do in traditional Jewish betrothals. It may be relevant to this mess that Freud had hoped for his daughter to marry Sander Ferenczi, <laughs> as he confessed to him in a letter on the very day of his daughter's 1909 wedding. Was Freud disappointed? Oops, here we have a picture of them. I, I actually, what I really needed is a picture of Freud looking longingly at Ferenczi, not a picture of Ferenczi <laughs> looking longingly at Freud. What can you do? Was Freud disappointed to be robbed of his role as a traditional head of yeshiva, sizing up his unmarried students for their son-in-law potential? Stymied from integrating his disciples into the Freud clan, Freud nevertheless paid homage to the traditional role of father-in-law by acting it out to no effect on Matilda, but wreaking havoc on her stand-ins in the kitchen. This constellation of blunders and affect draws not only from sexual anxieties and religious impulses, but also from the post-traditional con condition Translators of this passage are called on not simply to render Freud's ostensibly transparent German, but also to parse if they do not simply repeat the twin motions of amnesia and cultural recovery. Explaining what it is Freud is describing in this passage, even if he doesn't quite know, he, he himself doesn't quite know or say, 
for what is Freud's body actually doing and what is Freud's German actually describing? Does Freud's glücklich bring, sorry, my glück bring in this, I, my German's basically Yiddish, some of you may have already figured that out. Does his glück bring in this Wort refer to the mazel tov that accompanies the ritual plate and glass breaking of Jewish betrothals and wedding, and which is also shouted humorously when someone breaks a plate accidentally? Is that what's going on here? Maybe even in the Freud household they did that? Um, or is Freud really, does he actually have in mind the um, adage associated with the Polterabend, that Scherben bring in Glick, shards bring luck? And what's the connection between those German and Jewish traditions? As charming as it is to hear those customs described in the habitual present tense in the Hebrew, and to hear Matilda's engagement rabbinically rendered as erusin, Wislowski's odd locution about blessing the shards suggests that he too is having a hard time pinning down these celebrations that Freud sees as the obvious motivation for his breakage. The inability of Freud's translators to settle on whether this ritual is still observed, right? Brill says it's customary to break some dishes. Um, Voslavsky says, no hagim or it's a feature of the past. In the standard edition, Tyson writes, it used to be the custom, repeats Freud's own blurring of the boundaries between present and past, abandoned custom that returns as unconscious slip. When mourning shades into melancholy, grief is stifled by disavowed hatred and ambivalence. Freud's secular melancholy has the, a nearly opposite structure, what has been disavowed, religion, folk tradition, the role of the father in traditional marriage, cannot be truly set aside given the love, erotic or Jewish, who knows, that persists after the renunciation. Benjamin views the task of the translator as gluing together the fragments of a vessel that has broken if these translators cannot heal the breach, it's because they too are inheritors of the same broken traditions that slipped through Freud's hands. The ingathering of Freud in Hebrew translation was not a one-time event, signed, sealed, delivered, when psychoanalysis found an institutional home in the land of Israel. Evidence that Freud's homecoming to Israel was not a settled matter is how often and insistently he was described as coming home, how regularly he needed to be brought home again, a place he glimpsed, but like Moses, never entered. A 1976 report by the Jewish Telegraphic Agency on the establishment of the Freud, Sigmund Freud share at Hebrew University began by a declaration of the American head of the committee that had created the chair the Hebrew University will now stand at the center of Freud's thinking. In some mystical sense, Sigmund Freud has come home at last. In August of 1977, the Congress of the International Psychoanalytic Society Association convened for its 30th Congress in Jerusalem, the first time it had met outside Europe. The president of the Israel, of the Israel Society and the holder of the new Freud chair greeted this, uh, Raphael Moses, greeted the guests assembled at the Binyanei Ha'uma in Jerusalem um, after Mayor Teddy Kolak spoke by acknowledging the ambivalence of this emotional relationship, but declaring between Freud and the land of Israel, but declaring that the ambivalence was now resolved. Throughout his life, Freud identified himself unequivocally with the Jewish people and their fate in 1932, Freud proposed to Judah Magnus, rector of the Hebrew University, that the first chair of psychoanalysis in the world be established at our university. When, their suggest when this suggestion was not accepted, the Hebrew University became, for Freud, your university. <laughs> but that is being rectified now, 45 years later. The Hebrew University is establishing the first academic chair in psychoanalysis anywhere the breach between Hebrew University and Freud has been healed. 
The four-day Congress was well attended despite worries that participants would stay away because of the heat, the high cost of travel, and the question of whether by meeting in the Jewish state, psychoanalysis might compromise its neutrality. Bluntly, it would be seen to be siding with the Israelis over the Arabs. The organizers were proud to report, despite this of robust att attendance of over 15,000, equaling that of the London Congress two years earlier. The theme, appropriately enough, was affect, with a special session on the intergenerational um, effects of Holocaust trauma. And I wonder if Laub, I should have checked to see if he had spoke, if he spoke there. A full musical program contributed to the high emotions. The Congress opened with a Haydn concert, concert and dinner was accompanied by sad shtetl music. And one evening was devoted to folk dancing to the rhythms of many nations. Paul, we luckily we have a fabulous, beautiful literary report um, by the psychoanalyst and literature professor Paul Schwaber, who I believe is still alive, uh, taught at Wesleyan for many years. He wrote hundreds and hundreds of psychoanalysts linking arms for a hora. That was not something you see every day or even dream about. <laughs> Schwaber, Schwaber? Schwaber? Schwaber delicately alludes here not only to the famous psychoanalytic interest and dreams, but also to the equally well-known conceptualization of the state of Israel as a realization of a dream. In Herzl's words, if you will it, it is no dream or legend. The meeting of the children of Freud and the children of Herzl, as it was described, of Herzl came at some delay, although Herzl and Freud had lived across the street from each other, where's the plaque? The men never met, despite um, Freud sending Herzl a copy of the Traumdeutung. Holding the Congress in Jerusalem provided, as Schwaber put it, a sense of progeny finding one another, although their ancestors could not. A culminating moment in this long delayed meeting was Anna Freud's inaugural lecture for the newly established chair to be held, as I said, by, by Moses. Anna Freud was too ill to attend and her lecture was read by Arthur Wallenstein at the, at the amphitheater of Mount Scopus, uh, where Lord Alfred Balfour had delivered his 1925 address at the opening of the university. This was a deeply symbolic location enclosed by groves of rustling trees that looked east across the Jordan toward the place where according to tradition, the children of Israel had first encountered the promised land. As Schwaber saw it, the Congress not only belatedly reconciled psychoanalysis and the Jewish people, it also seemed to transform the fraught relationship between psychoanalysis and the Jewish religion. As psychoanalysts sporting their IPAC 1977 badges swarmed Jerusalem's sacred sites with one young delegate, his eyes closed, swaying among the Hasidim at the Western Wall. And yet, this emotional meeting was not an uncomplicated homecoming. Psychoanalysis arrived in Jerusalem at a, different, a difficult moment um, when observers were becoming more aware of what Schwaber described as Israel's social and political inequities, still no peace, and major disagreements about how to achieve it, and emotional scandals. Um, another reporter, on the, another person who wrote beautifully about this particular Congress, uh, Shelley or Orgel, reported on the symposium on, tra on training was for the first time held before the Congress. And she expressed a similar thought, writing that a pre-Congress marked by so much sharing of personal information encouraged her to speak openly about what it meant to be doing this in Jerusalem for me, there's a, there, there's a real connection between one meaning of Israel and what is essential to our work. Both aim to cure illness. Both recognize that the cure is slow and uncertain and that dark places in the human mind, buried in long forgotten and repressed paths, need to be brought into the light of confrontation to keep memories alive in order to approach the peace of true reconciliation 
with the history we have in common. Freud's first Hebrew translators had aimed to bring Freud back to his homeland, which was every Jew's as they saw it. So too were the missions of psychoanalysis and Zionism parallel to cure sickness, the sickness of the diaspora Jew. By 1977, this dream found a form of fulfillment complicated by unresolved memories and trauma, the Holocaust trauma discussed at the Congress and the Palestinian conflict, conflict implied only indirectly in these reports. This indirection too now appears to us to be a form of repression. In the famous 2002 lecture at the other Freud Museum, later published as Freud the non and the non-European, Edward Said suggested that Freud himself had anticipated the return of the repressed Palestinian in Moses and monotheism, which he reads as Freud's attempt to undermine any doctrinal attempt to put Jewish identity on a solid foundation, whether religious or secular. Contrasting Freud's openness to the non-Jewish other with Israeli governmental policies, Said argues that quite differently from the spirit of Freud's deliberately provocative reminders that Judaism's founder was a non-Jew and that Judaism begins in the realm of Egyptian non-Jewish monotheism, Israeli legislation countervenes represses and even can cancels Freud's carefully maintained opening out of Jewish identity towards its non-Jewish background. The complex layers of the past have been eliminated by Israel. For Jacqueline Rose, who was Saeed's respondent at that lecture, what Saeed was pointing out was that Israel's suppression of Palestinians also signified that Israel represses Freud, um, Israel represses Freud. Perhaps this was nowhere true than the piece, truer than at the piece of Herodian wool that so appealed to the psychoanalysts with their IPAC badges. And this is not the Herodian wool. This is, this is the separation wall and Banksy's art on it. A little bit of a mismatch between what I'm saying and what I'm showing. This lecture began by focusing largely on the effective drives by which translators attempted to bring Freud back to a Jewish homeland against the context of Freud's at-homeness in Vienna or his wandering through the European literary and philosophical tradition. In his lecture, Said made clear that those were not the only options. The era I began by describing is long over. Translators now bring to Freud's work a Hebrew stripped of the high prophetic tones beloved by Devosis and Voslovsky, distancing themselves from the effects their predecessors prized in pursuit of a post-Zionist Freud. The gifted and, pro um, and prolific translator Ruth Ginsburg, um, who is my hero, um, and along with my mother, um, and here you see the, the works that she's translated um, rejected Moshe Ater's um, 1978 Moses and Monotheism, not translated not that long before, because it was saturated in all the Hebrew language strata, biblical, rabbinic, medieval, and modern, in the same way that Adam Phillips tries to wrench Freud away from the scientific Latin of the standard edition, Ginsburg and her peers seek to recover a Freud not yet hijacked by his Jewish rescuers. Um, perhaps this too is a rescue fantasy. Ginsburg reminds us that Freud read the Bible in German translation, where uh, uh, Ater and various earlier translators, um, all they had to do when they reached a, a point in their translation where Freud was quoting the Philipson Bible, they could pull the Tanakh down from the shelf and find what Philipson had been translated, not Ruth Ginsburg. She translates the Philipson Bible into modern Hebrew. Um, and she describes this process uh, in this way. I reverted to the word monotheism in the title. Instead of adopting Ater's emunat ha-yichud, um, 
emunat, the faith of unification, which is resonant with the Hebrew Bible, the prayer book, the hymn, commentary, Kabbalah. I was looking for linguistic elements, tricks even, that would estrange Hebrew and make it different, Egyptian, at least a little. If Freud is brought home in these Hebrew translation, translations, it's to a home prior to and different than the borders into which Perlman placed him. As with Said's Egyptian Freud, we are in the presence, even in the Holy Land, of a stranger, you can almost say emptier Freud, than the one earlier translators had glimpsed in the shining Jewish mirror of their prose. Reflecting on translating Freud's The Uncanny, Ginsberg writes, in the merciless mirror of the other language, the original sees its own empty spaces, the places it confronts and evades, experiences of the world for which only other, the other language has morphemes, morphemes or words. Via the other language, the lacuna of one's own language are reflected. Indeed, Psychoanalysis was not only formulated by what the German language says, it was conceived in what it and its creator, Sigmund Freud, did not, could not, or would not articulate. When Freudian psychoanalysis saw itself reflected in Hebrew, in my Hebrew, she writes, what did it see? And Freud, who refused to look into the Hebrew language, what did he not see? What did he not see? I'm going to end by just saying another word about Dory Laub, if that's all right. I am no great scholar, and I know there are many people in this room who knew Dory Laub personally, know, knew his work much more thoroughly than I did, and I don't know what he would say in the present moment, though I'm hoping to learn more from all of you tomorrow. I'll just say that it's apparent far beyond psychoanalytic circles that we are living through a catastrophic return of the repressed, a failure to reach consensus about reality itself, an unfolding crisis of testimony in which receptive listeners are few and far between. In his meditation of this tale, uh, on the tale of the emperor's new clothes, Dory Laub talks about the collective delusions that engulf a culture, but he also strikes a note of hope in the child who calls out the emperor's nakedness, willing to stand out from the crowd in the service of a truth that others do not, cannot, and will not see. Laub writes, it's the very commitment to truth in a dialogic context with an authentic listener, which allows for a reconciliation with a broken palm promise and which makes the resumption of life possible. The testimony cannot bring back the dead, undo the horror, or reestablish the safety, the authenticity, or the harmony of what was home. But neither does it succumb to death or to an ongoing repetitious embattlement with the past. It is a dialogic process of exploration of two worlds that are different and will always remain so. Thank you. so much. I'm sorry I realized that was too long. No? Thank you so much for, so much for this incredible um, interesting and instructive lecture. Um, you, you, you know we are so much uh, thinking about Freud also as a letter writer and I so much like the idea of Freud trying to get um, his translator divorces on the phone and they can see <laughs> it is well, it's really really nice so um dear audience you may um, have first questions or reactions or complaints or complaints <laughs> I <don't> think so <laughs> but that's the crazy one. <laughs> <laughs> so i i may start with the first question so um if, if I understood you right, um, it's only in 2007 that the first uh, uh, translation into Hebrew of the interpretation of dream? Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry, the interpretation of dreams is, so basically the Hebrew translation of Freud 
unlike, um, well, I guess in English you could say there are three stages. There's the Brill, um, and then there's the Standard Edition, and then there's the Phillips era, you could say. Um, in Hebrew, uh, there's the, these earliest translations, um, the ones I talked about here, and then there's another, um, a 50s, 60s, 70s, when Freud was translated numerous times, and these, I skipped over them, but some of these translators were, um, and they tended to be translated pretty much in the Zionist vein um, and in psychoanalytic series. And um, I'm sorry, not, yeah, yeah, I mean, Amoved is the first psychoanalytic series, that's the 90s. So prior to that, they were not in psychoanalytic series, they were in German Jewish writing, and now they're being the main um, translator of psychoanalysis is the Wrestling Press, and Wrestling is from you know the orange books. Wrestling is taken from a, um, an essay by Roland Barthes. So we're in a totally different. We're we're now fully international in. So it's you know Freud alongside Agamben and and Chris Deva and you know etc. That's and, and that's the kind of psychoanalysis we now have in Israel. So she was referring to, so the, the first, I'm pretty sure the first interpretation of dreams is in the, maybe in the 60s, which is actually fairly late, and why wasn't it earlier? And there too, I could have used that as an example of um, the difference between, even in the title, you can hear the, the biblical resonances of the interpretation of dreams, Joseph is a dream interpreter. Um, all, even though Freud very clearly says in the interpretation of dreams, um, biblical dream interpretation is not what I'm talking about. You know, Jews are never willing to take a, that kind of negation at face value. Um, and Freud himself said, you know, I do have some kind of inclination to ally myself with the biblical dream translator. He says in the interpretation of dreams because he had an, you know, he himself is a dream translator. So it's an extremely biblically resonant Zionist, let's call it, translation. And uh, Ruth Gins Ginsburg translated this as an attempt to um, neutralize those associations in much the same way. I mean, Moses and monotheism is just a very good example of the same, her same tri style. Sorry, that was way longer than you needed. You can also ask me about Yiddish if you want to know about Yiddish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, Actually, it was a wonderful lecture, and um, I'm sure it's a whole other chapter, section, or another lecture, but I would love to know about the Yiddish. You can give a brief. When yeah, thank you for his relationship to the Yiddish translators and the translation. Thank you. Yeah, so um, how was so Freud was very. I actually only have one chapter in out of nine about the Hebrew translation of Freud because um, there's an excellent. There are a few excellent books about on this topic, and I just thought I didn't. I actually tried to find out if Dory Lab was a native Yiddish speaker, and I think he wasn't. So German Hebrew seemed more appropriate, but um, on y the Yiddish connection is, is a very intricate and, and close one. Um, and obviously, you know, Freud had some Yiddish, it was easier for him, he certainly, under, could, you know, the way I walk around Vienna using my Yiddish and people more or less understand me. So there's a much closer connection and Freud also personally met um, representatives from YIVO. I mean, it, it was a connection of translation. Um, so Freud had an authorized Yiddish translator who was Max Weinreich, who unlike the ones in Palestine, um, spent time in Vienna. He was psychoanalyzed, but not by Freud. Um, and uh, Max Weinreich was not only Freud's authorized um, translator, but also um, himself was doing psychoanalytic we inflected work on Jewish youth. He wrote a book called Der Weg zu unserer Jugend, uh, which was an attempt to, I, I, the way I describe it is, Freud says in one of the prefaces to, to Devos's work, I forget which one at the moment, he says, 
I, I'm not a national Jew, I'm not a religious Jew, but there's something Jewish that I, you know, goes very deep and one day science will find it. And um, most people see this as a kind of almost like either a sort of joke or a, a mystical, but in fact, that's exactly what was going on at Inivo. I mean, people were trying to figure out what Jewishness was and how it was unconsciously transmitted. And Freud had some connection to, heard about, we know from reports that Freud met with some representatives um, and heard about this work when he was already in London in the very last days of his life. Um, so this relationship was, went in both directions. Um, in other words, like, um, it was a special, maybe I could say it was a special relationship. Obviously psychoanalysis was everywhere in the world. And certainly I'm not making any great claims that Hebrew or speakers or Yiddish speakers had any, um, you know, were important in the reception of psychoanalysis. But it's clear to me that Freud felt that way. And he actually, you know, there are stories of him asking these YIVO representatives whether they're upset that, you know, he published a book like Moses and Monotheism. Basically any Jew that crossed his path in the last year of his life was like, was that a terrible thing to do? You know, Freud sees these like more Jewish Jews as kind of like the representatives in the YIVO. The Eva representatives who came to visit him in London were like, no, you have to tell the truth for the sake of science. Before I'd had to hear that from a Yiddish speaker, you know. I mean, he knew it himself, but there was something about hearing it from a, a, a I don't know, Jewy or a Jew that, that helped him feel better. So anyway, the, my book has a chapter on the reception of Freud in the Yiddish press. There was a Freud craze in the 30s in Poland and New York. I think the one thing that I discovered that people didn't know before, I think, this might be the one little piece of info, is that when you read a history of why, why is Buenos Aires such a huge psychoanalytic city, right? Uh, um, so a little investigation there. Um, so basically when you read the histories of psychoanalysis in, in Buenos Aires, it says that psychoanalysis basically arrived in Buenos Aires in 1931. It was like one of these early, um, lecture somebody started a, a reading circle of Freud's work so a, a rather belated history um, if there's a, a you know a, the National Library of Israel has a archive has an online digital arc, um, archive where you can look at the Buenos Aires Yiddish Press the Buenos Aires Yiddish Press recorded advertisements for at least 10 lectures on Freud to Yiddish speakers in the 19, in 1926 and 1924. Um, so Freud was a big deal in Buenos Aires Yiddish circles in the 20s. So um, it, one of the places in which the, uh, Freud was not belated in Jewish languages, but early. So I don't know why that seems so significant, but um, so, and then I have a chapter also about what it means to translate you know, translating from German into Yiddish is always a, you know, you can take the easy path or you can make it a more Jewish translation. And um, Freud's first two translators, who were not Weinreich, um, but Sarah Lehrmann, and they took the path of just Germanizing Freud's, uh, just Yiddish, just putting Freud's, just y producing a very Yiddish, sorry, a very German Yiddish which is very easy to do if you're a translator, right? You just basically turn it into Yiddish, you put it into Hebrew letters and, you know, um, et cetera. And Weinrach, because he was a Yiddishist and a nationalist and believed that Yiddish was an independent tongue and needed to be able to say anything, including Freud, um, in its indigenous um, language, uh, look for Hebraic or, you know, Hebrew, Yiddish has a lot of, there are a lot of words that you could say either with the Germanic component or the Hebraic component. So Weinreich took the Hebraic component. So drive, trib is instead of trib as earlier translators had done, it's yetzer. Those of you who know Hebrew, yetzer is a yetzer hatov, yetzer hara, yetzer is a rabbinic anthropology of the, whatever it is that causes us to, you know, do bad things. 
but as, as, as the rabbis knew, without the Yetzir Hara, you wouldn't have eggs for your, as they put it, you wouldn't have eggs for, for breakfast in the morning. You need the Yetzir. So there's a kind of rabbinic, the, these attempts to, dis, the, these translators, whether they meant to or not, found these pathways into rabbinic thought or mystical thought. Um, so yeah, so so Weinreich produced, a, and for the unconscious, he had, or conscious, he had the word visik, visik, and visikite, to um, to get away from bavust sign, which means something different in Yiddish. It means well known as like a person. It doesn't mean or umbavust sign. So um, yeah, the Yiddish. My chapter on on the translation is called the Yiddish unconscious. Uh, because I don't know how many of you know that there's like a long, uh, the association between Yiddish and the unconscious of assimilating Jews is a long, um, it's, it's almost a, an ideology. And um, the, the ideology is that if you scratch a German speaker, for instance, Freud, you will find buried in there somehow the Yiddish tongue that emerges in moments of great stress. So what's the translators are doing is recovering that moment. And you know, we have um, Freud in the psychopathology. He takes the hammer, he takes the tuning fork instead of the hammer, and he says, Hammer, which he says in Hebrew means ass. <laughs> he associates to a Hebrew word. And I'm like, um, no, it means. You know, if he's really speaking Hebrew, it would be chamar. He's actually, so Freud doesn't quite say that. It's Yiddish that pops out in this moment when he picks up the wrong, when he calls himself an idiot, chamar. I took the wrong thing. And he, anyway, it's a moment that, well, you don't know the whole psychopathology by heart? <laughs> Where am I? What am I doing here? <laughs> anyway, that was, I, that was a somewhat incoherent, but the book is coming out in a few weeks, really, I think. Early May. Just, just a small question. I know this wasn't a subtle just being um, um, because you were you were thank you, first of all, for a brilliant mm. lecture. Yes, oh, it was thank wonderful. You. Um what about the influence of his mother? You talked about mother tongue and um since rumor has it, and you know you probably know this better, but that he did visit uh, his mother every Saturday and right. supposedly she spoke Yiddish so to what extent he was yeah quite yeah. well aware and maybe knew even a little Hebrew uh, through her to what extent this whole idea like if you scratch a little bit you know uh, right. some Yiddish will come out maybe at moments like this so I think people love the idea that Freud really knew Yiddish and he look he would have to if he the parent and his father so my method, so my method in the book was to bracket the question of um, how much Yiddish Freud knew, how much Hebrew he knew, right? This is Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi. Um, and actually, the um, it's Theodore Reich in one interview, or I forget who it is. There's one, there's one source that says that his mother spoke Yiddish. Everybody quotes the same one source. Um, what I decided to do to differentiate myself coming so late to this field and being somewhat of an outsider to it is to bracket who Freud really was and resist the temptation that I considered part of Freud's studies in the 1990s, which is to psychoanalyze Freud and uncover the buried Jewishness or the buried homosexuality or the buried whatever, and instead use that instead write a book about that game. So how is it that people, why is it? So, so why is it that everyone wants to know? Like for the first three or four years that I was thinking about writing this book, it's like, so did Freud actually know Yiddish? And what I do is say, why is it that we wanna know? What is it that we wanna know when we wanna know the answer to that question? And how has that question been answered um, over the generations, including during Freud's own lifetime, Freud was like bothered by various people, like especially this guy, A.A. A. Robach, a Yiddishist who was also a psychologist. Who there's some correspondence between Freud and 
Robach in the Library of Congress, and every single letter for 10 years is like, so, how much Yiddish do you know? <laughs> and then, can you tell me your Hebrew name? And every single one, Freud's like, I don't really actually know, you know. And, and, um, and Robach does not give up with like his last letter, like to London, you know, is your Hebrew name this? And can I like, so what I wanted to talk about was not, this is a new book that will tell you something about Freud that you didn't know, but to talk about how, especially Jews, had such a desire to connect with him below the, you know, everybody else, oh, he's brilliant, he's famous, he has these complicated ideas. On that Jewish level, the way Jews want to connect to each other, even when they don't exactly know whether they're allowed to anymore in the modern period, and Freud writes about this, right, in the joke book, right? The, the, the German Jew who walks into the train cabinet and, the, you know, the Galician or Jew, all these jokes about that particular connection, like making this connection. So, and, and why is it that if Freud really did know Yiddish, as Yerushalmi says, as Reich thought, as, why is he not, like, why doesn't he not want to, you know, allow people the pleasure? He says, I hate to deprive you of the pleasure it would clearly give you, <laughs> says this to Robach. If you found, and you're a, a great champion of the Yiddish language, but you know Freud's like he he's desirable. He's an object of desire. During the, one of the things that I covered, this is one of I have one chapter that's just Freud and popular culture, and there's nothing fancy about it, and it's just about famous Jews and lists of famous Jews in the 1920s and the 1930s, and it was a kind of craze. Like people, there would be arguments about famous Jews and. There's, you know, the explosion of newspaper culture. They needed to fill the pages. These are Jewish readers. They basically, what did they want? They wanted to be quote unquote educated. They wanted to be entertained and they wanted to hear about famous Jews. There was only one person in the world that could do all that in one, in one person and that was Freud. So Freud was like famous and persecuted for being Jewish an added benefit. Um, I mean, <laughs> he was, he wrote about sex and he was highbrow. So you could feel sophisticated and important. And, um, and you know, what the details were. Yeah, so, so basically Freud was everywhere in the Jewish press, usually in a very superficial way, but in the more highbrow press in, in, in great, in immense detail. So one of the, I mean, Freud always talked about the resistances to his, actually the first thing that was published in Hebrew was before the books, I think in 1924, was resistances to psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Freud had in his favor with at least some audiences was um, there was something about the Jewish connection that could help people overcome resistances. Does that make sense? Well, by not, I mean, by not making him, by refusing to be the object of their desire, he created more desire, right? I mean, it sounds like what you're saying, that from the very beginning, it was a sort of this... He was holding back. Yes, and that made him more desire. Except at the very end. So uh, one of the most moving things, I mean, at the very end, he, um, he reached out to... He allowed, you know, there's a period in his life when he was being very careful about who he was seeing. And, you know, he, 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 he wouldn't go to the Royal Society to pick up his medal because he, he wanted to, he'd rather hang out with his dog. Oh, I forgot to say I have a chapter about Jews and dogs. <laughs> um, I remember the sentence I had, I got lost halfway through, which is that this is a backwater in the reception of psychoanalysis, but it, it's also a, a royal road, maybe, or at least in my opinion. Um, so at the very end, he had this, you know, he had this emotional connection to YIVO, um, which he, he described YIVO as, as a sister institution, this institution for the study of Eastern European Jews, where Freud was taught and where people use psychoanalytic methods and where they deliberately, I mean, this to me is the biggest scandal, I think, of my whole book, which is that there's a world of psychoanalysts out there and 
books upon books about Freud's Jewishness, and nobody seems to know that during Freud's own lifetime, with someone that he was in conversation with, the question of what Jewishness was and how to understand its unconscious transmission, not genetically, they weren't interested in that, but in earliest childhood from parent to child and what it was that was being transmitted, not religiously, but unconsciously, which is where dogs come in. Um, they were very interested in dog pho phobias. And as we know, the, Freud's first, um, Freud's first, well, Freud's only child uh, case study is, is little Hans who had an animal phobia. So they worked on animal phobias in Vilna at the Evo Institute. Freud, I mean, much, much earlier had written a case study in which there's one footnote about, um, strange footnote about circumcision in there, but there's also an exchange of letters with Max Graf about why it's important to raise the child Jewish because, um, because Jews, he will be treated, I think what Freud said is, he'll be treated, he'll, he'll encounter anti-Semitism in any case, but to grow up Jewish means to grow up with the strength to deal with anti-Semitism. He didn't further elaborate, but if you wanna understand what that means, read Max Weinrath's entire book which is basically a description of how it is that Jews develop compensatory mechanisms, which is a concept that he, he discovered from race scientists in the American South, for, which basically salve the ego when it faces insult. Um, and basically, Weinrath considered all of Jewish religion to be a kind of elaborate compensatory mechanism and believed it, unfortunately, wasn't working as well as it should, that the Jewish ego needed some help. And he actually talked about these famous Jews as forms of secular, modern compensatory mechanisms. And he gives a long list of all the famous Jews in these lists. And he doesn't mention Freud, I think, just because it would have been weird and self-referential to say. And even though Freud, on every list of famous Jews, is number one, him and Einstein, which is why they met each other, because they knew they were on the list of famous Jews. Anyway. I have another question here. Oh, that's so fascinating. No, I have to rethink my question. Um, actually, um, how do Hebrew translators deal with um, the underlying Latin traditions, like in libido or in ego or something else, uh, but even more complicated, maybe, it, it. with Greek traditions, for example, Cathasis, and even more Thanatos, because as far as I know, the idea of death is very different in the two cultures, uh, yeah. Greek culture. Uh, yeah. There are many senses, of course, but the, the central conception is different from the, from the Jewish or Hebrew. Mm. I've just, I have a glossary here in the back, if that would help. Oh, I'm raining little pieces of Freud, uh, little shards, broken <laughs> shards of Freud translation. Um, it's, so it, not only are we talking about, so it's very different from Yiddish, where it's, you know, more or less neighboring languages. There's, how do you say it? There's a German term for it two languages that are more or less closely. So in Hebrew, um, right, this, what, I, what I tried to argue is that the initial response was to try to go for medieval philosophical um, equivalents of some sort to discover, um, I'm looking at what, so you, so you just mentioned libido, transference. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, I'm looking to, uh, so th there was a condensation, mizug, libido. <laughs> libido is libido. This is where they throw up their their hands. <laughs> Jews apparently don't know about libido until Freud tells them about it. <laughs> you think, which is interesting because, as I said, Trib is you know the Weinrach came up with Yetzer, so. Um, uh, 
Yeah, I, I just read a very interesting article about how they came up with the word for clitoris. Um, so I don't know if that's of interest to anybody here. <laughs> Oneg, Lust. Um, oh, here, hey, <laughs> here he has clitoris. But uh, very early, so the, the, this is a period in which we're not just talking about how to translate Freud. We're talking about how to use, you know, they don't have words for a lot of things, right? I mean, the language is basically being revived in the same decade that Freud, I mean, people, Eliezer Ben Yehuda in Jerusalem is doing his weird little thing with his family, but it's really being revived in the North, in the second Aliyah. Um, and what you have is the Hebrew Language Academy, which is basically inventing words. And the rules are that if you can find some kind of word with Hebraic, you, you start with Hebrew and the Hebrew, all the strata of Hebrew. If you can't find anything there, you go to Arabic. Um, and then, only then, do you go international. But no one's really following any of these rules and there's no rhyme or reason. And every single one has a glossary and the glossary has not been, was not standardized until the 1990s. And it took them, you know, figuring out what a slip was, Verleistung, um, there's at least six, which I love because, right, <laughs> it's like parapraxis is it's supposedly the worst translation in the standard edition. And, you know, Bruno Bettelheim makes fun of it, but it's parapraxis. It's just, it, it's, an, it, it's, it, it's a perfect description of, of translation, full of mistakes, but we try and we don't know what we're doing. We drop the thing, right? So uh, I think now we have, um, it was Maseh Shkaga in, in um, Shkaga is a rabbinic term, Bemezid uh, Ubishkaga. It's like the distinction between something you do intentionally and something you do unintentionally. But it has, you know, for Freud, a, 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 a slip isn't a sin, whereas in Hebrew it's connected to a, a kind of ideology of sin. So. Again, are they discovering something? You know, Freud has this example. This is actually a good example. The, par, uh, the introductory lectures, which is translated into Yiddish by Weinreich, and uh, Devosis does it the same year, 35, 30, 34, 35, right around the same period it's being uh, translated into English and, and Yiddish. And one of the um, dreams that Freud describes is somebody uh, has a dream that his uncle, um, although it's, Samstag is smoking a cigarette. And, um, and then a woman is seated with a child on her lap. It's a two images side by side. I asked the question, what happens with, instead of reading it from the, from the religious to the sexual, you read it from the sexual to the Yiddish, right from left to right, right to left, because that's what the translators are doing. Let's read Freud in the other direction. So, um, the, he has to explain in, in German that you have to understand that this patient was uh, a religious Jew, so that's why it's a sin to, but the real sin, of course, is incest. I'm like, yeah, maybe not. I see it. Um, this, so, yeah, that was sort of an answer to something. <laughs> I think so. Um, one more question, one, one last question, question yeah. maybe. I just want to one bit. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. so. You were saying that, um, that the Hebrew translations basically also followed the evolution of the language itself as the time, time right. went by. So I was just wondering, was, there, was this in any way, do you have any evidence that it would have been a two-way street? So because some term was for, used in Hebrew to translate a particularly important term by Freud, then it kind of took on a certain type of meaning in the language later that would have been somehow. Yes, absolutely. Um, the Freud had a huge influence on, on the development of Hebrew, on Zionist culture, on, yeah, what it, you know, the kibbutz movement was designed to be a place that, you know, where children know not Oedipus. I guess is the, I think it was the language that was used. But, um, but also the language itself um, yeah, there's an article in Haaretz like 10 years ago of like how Freud changed the Hebrew language. Along with Buenos Aires, Tel Aviv is a very psychoanalytic city, right?
I, I just would like to come back to the books and our exhibition because if you haven't seen it, we have a beautiful um, copy of the Hebrew trans translation of Totman Tabu of um, Divorces. <laughs> we have one. We have one. We are also showing the page with the Blusa explaining the German and the new Hebrew words. Oh, the glossary. Oh, the glossary, yes. Sorry, which you will see um, tomorrow. Um, but as a matter of fact, and we are sitting here and viewing um, the different languages, uh, translation of Freud's text in different many languages, and we have so many different uh, languages in the exhibition space, but I, I admit that I was just realizing um, before um, when I was preparing for the lecture that we do have some Hebrew translation, but no Yiddish one. And I think it might be difficult to purchase one, but I think this will be our task for the next months to do so. Um, yes, and with these words, I, I also have two copies of uh, the Psychopathology of Everyday Life. I would, I actually like this one a little bit better, but I'll give you the other one. I'll mail it to you. Yes, uh, the, uh, one is the first edition, one is the second edition, both 1928. I just love this one because it was a library book. Well, I mean, yeah, this is great, but this is another very generous act. But first of all, I would like to say thank you, or we, we would like to say thank you for this, um, as you said, brilliant lecture. And you gave us so many things to think about. And I'm happy that we can continue tomorrow. We start at, uh, at 1 p.m. Uh, in the afternoon uh, with a short introduction of the archive and then your film, The Listener. And uh, yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank thank you. You. Thank you.